want to quickly um, acknowledge all the sponsors for this uh, Theme 15 session, Geology with a Cultural Lens. Without their contributions, we could not have had all these wonderful people come from different islands and different places all over the world who are not geochemists and would not have otherwise been in this meeting to share their knowledge with us. And with that, I just want to introduce the topic of, uh, of today's uh, theme for, or topic for theme 15. And today we're going to focus on the dynamic Earth, on changes on Earth, how uh, the people of Hawaii have looked at changes, view changes, regard changes, and conduct their lives with these changes around them. We will also talk about climate changes and how they impact uh, island populations, fisheries, and issues of environmental justice associated with that. And then we'll shift into doing research or communicating research that has to do with including indigenous knowledge or working with indigenous people to share or to understand their background knowledge and include them in uh, help us learn from them what we know. Um, the way this will go is each one of our speakers will come to the podium, share, first introduce themselves and they're all from NGOs or working in, really, in some form of nonprofit organization. They'll say a little bit about that and then they will start their talk. Um, in between, we'll need a minute or two to shift to the next talk and that will give the opportunity for the speaker to also uh, introduce themselves. So I will not do more introductions and we can start with the first speaker. So this is to go forward, this is to go backwards. Okay. You can see the presentation oh, there. Perfect. You can introduce yourself first. <laughs> Aloha Kako. You guys have to say aloha ba. Aloha. Yeah. Aloha is a reciprocal thing. So if you're new to the islands and it's, aloha is the greeting of compassion and warmth, sure. But for the most part, aloha is a reciprocal thing. So I'm going to do it again. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you. Um, my name is Hui Hui Kanahele Mossman. I'm the executive director of the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation. Um, our mission is to um, raise uh, um, awareness um, to Native Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian populations of the highly intelligentsia of their kupuna, of their elders, and bring that, bring that um, knowledge and, and intelligence to present time. Um, I am the, um, our tradition rests on, um, on hula and seven generations of that practice of hula, and that's basically our base of knowledge. I am happy to be here at this conference I am presenting on a methodology um, that was um, put together, not, not created, not discovered, but rather compiled um, by my mother, Pua Kanahele, um, several years ago, back in 2006. We started to disseminate and implement this methodology out to everybody on our islands. and. The purpose of this methodology is to um, is to mimic the way that our ancestors look at their environment. Um, this methodology is called Papaku Makavalu. I mean, so if you want to be really well liked by the indigenous people of an area that you work in, the number one thing to do is learn how to pronounce their words. You don't have to speak their language. No, you don't even need to just pronounce their words. So we're going to practice that today. Everybody say Papaku Makavalu. Okay, I heard the panel and I heard Adina. Everybody else, Papaku Makavalu. Oh, great start. This Papaku Makavalu method is an organization of our environment. 
Um, and we break up our environment into three areas of study. Number one is Papahanao Moko, which is the word you see up on screen. Everybody say Papahanao Moko. Good, thank you. Okay. And the next area of study is Papahuli Lani. Everybody say Papahuli Lani. And Papahuli Honua. Hey, thank you. As you can see in these two words here that says Papa Huli Lani and Papa Huli Honua, the last part of the word changes, Lani and Honua. That tells you that those are two different areas of study. The first one, Papa Huli Lani, is an area of study of the atmosphere. Everything that's up there above our heads, that is the study of Papa Huli Lani, because Lani is our atmosphere. Papahuli Honua is the study of everything that's on the earth. Our volcanoes, our water, our ocean, um, the rivers, etc. All of that is Papahuli Honua because Honua is earth, everything that's below our feet. Okay. Okay, excuse my organization. I'm talking about an organization of our environment and my slides aren't organized. So hold on one second. Okay, I'm gonna talk about this word here, papahanaomoku. Okay, it's made up of three different terms. The first term is papa, the next term is ha now, and the last term is moko. Okay, everybody say papa ha now moko. Papa ha now moko. Okay, great. As you see, it doesn't really sound like papa huli lani, um, but it is the third area of study. Papa is a class or a level. Ha now is to be born or to give birth. Moku is to separate or to, to uh, a separate section that duplicates the origin, like a child. It's separated from the mother, but it duplicates the mother in, in, in almost every way, okay? That's the word moku. So put it all together, and this is the study of things that are born. Okay, hold on, I'm going all the way back. Okay, now the good thing about those people who study Papa Hanao Moku or the things that are born, which is my section of study, um, is that we, people who study Papa Hanao Moku, have a manual. We have an instruction book, so to speak. Um, and that instruction book, is called the Komolipo. The Komolipo is, a, um, is the source of this area of study of Papahanao Moku, mainly because you see that word Hanao, that's the very first word you see there after line 15, colon, the word Hanao is repeated over and over and over again in this, in this list 2019 lines of ancestral text. Um, and the word, and with the, the 2000 and, uh, 2019 lines of ancestral text, all of it describes things that are born. That's all. It doesn't describe the making of the earth, it doesn't describe the creation of heavens or whatever that is, just things that are born. Man doesn't come into the picture until chapter eight, which is line 868, I think. Okay. This book of instruction begins with the, fourth, the first 14 lines. And the first 14 lines describes darkness. 
and the darkness specifically that life originates in. Okay. Not the ethereal darkness or darkness. I mean, it may describe that, but we're talking about things that are born. Okay. So it describes those level of darkness that begins birth, such as the darkness that exists within a womb, the darkness that exists within a yolk sac, the darkness that exists within, within a seed coat. So all of those things that are born come from the darkness that's described in these lines here. Um, the source of the darkness that intensifies, the source of the darkness that creates the intensity of this and the intensity of the sun and the intensity of light. So in the intense, intense dark, and then coming out of that darkness as as light, as a darkness, as light begins to to um, uh, be able to get through that darkness, and then after that, the uh, the our organism is then born. Um, the first section after these first lines um, talk about, as you can see, talks about hanau, that word hanau again, to be born. It starts off with the coral polyps. It goes to sea urchins right after that. After the sea urchins, it goes to um, seaweed. And then seaweed, then it partners up. Um, that's the other my mystery about this manual. All manuals have mysteries, yeah? The mystery about this manual is the partnership between the seaweed and the plants that are grown on land. Um, after which, sorry, I apologize, go back, okay. After which we see the lines 208, 209, 210. These lines repeat itself over and over and over again in the first five sections of our instruction manual called the Kumulipo. These lines are unique to this text, this ancestral text, because it specifically talks about how plants obtain water, because this first section is only about plants. Okay, so it says, I'm going to say it in Hawaiian for a little bit. It talks about vai. Everybody say vai. Okay, that's an important word to know over here in these islands because that is water. Okay. And so it talks about how the plants obtain vai. The next section that has to do with um, fish talks about how the fish obtain food through the seawater. The next section that has to do with birds talks about how birds obtain food through the, the, the fruits and, and, um, and meat. So that's how these sections are divided. So, vai, ha nau kane ya vai ololi o ka vahine ya vai olola, ha nau ka e kaha noho i kai ki a ia e ka e kaha noho iuka, he po uhe e ka vava he nuku he vai ka aia kala au o ke kia kua ke komo aale komo ke kanaka. A lot of the, the sessions I went to prior to this, um, that's how they sounded to me, you know, like how <laughs> I sound to you all saying this first. Um, anyway, the other cool thing about this instruction manual is it tells us exactly what's happening with the water and how the plants intake water. I'll come back to that. So, ha nau kane ga vai ololi. Kane, or the sun, or heat, or energy. Okay, that's what kane is. Kane is that heat, it's that thermal energy, it's that energy that starts to excite molecules. Okay. So, kane, that sun, that heat, produces the means of passage of water through the cells of a plant. Vai, water. Olo means to shake or to, uh, olo means to rub um, back and forth. Li is another way of saying um, to shudder or to shake. So it describes how water molecules, and we all know that water is a very unique molecule, 
um, it's a polar bond, you have the two hydrogen um, um, adhering to the oxygen, and because it's a polar bond, it cohesives to everything else. And so that's what it's doing, is that the water molecules cohe uh, cohesion um, with the, the cells of the plant, and up the xylem it goes to feed the rest of the plant. This is in that section. It tells us exactly how plants get their water. Okay. The next line says, Okavahine kavai olola. Wahine is, what is wahine? Yeah, it's a female. Okay. So as you can see, it's a female characteristic. I don't know for sure if it is, but if you look at the picture there, Maybe you can tell me if it's a female characteristic. But this process here, the way that the plant releases water or produces water and oxygen is a female um, process. Okay. So, okavahine yavai olola. And that's the way that the plant releases. So the intake is the wai ololi, it's a male process. The release is a wai olola, it's a female process. This instruction manual, or 2,000 lines of text, tells us that's how things get their water. Okay. The next line is he po uhe e ikavava. And then this line just simply tells us, this simply is how plants are dispersed throughout the islands. He po po is dark or unseen. Uhe is to slip, um, slip, slide, slippery, all of that is uhe. Baba is an opening or a channel. So plants slip through these channels, especially on my island, as is Hawaii Island, where we have all of these lava tubes all over the place and water running through all of them. Um, we have this, we have a very efficient way of dispersing seeds from upland Mauka to Makai down uh, by the ocean. Henuko he vai ka'ai akala'au. This tells us exactly which part of the plant is responsible for intaking the water. Nuku is a beak. Nuku is another word also for the root tip. So henuku he vai, which tells us the root tip. He vai, which tells us water is ka'ai, or the food, or nutrient, a ka la'au, la'au is plant. So it tells us the root tip intakes the water, which is the food for the plant. Really simple. Okay. And this mele then, um, this, this, section, which is a very short section, maybe five lines long that I just recited to you all right now, repeats itself over and over and over and over again within this 22,000 line text. Okay. And then the last line of these five lines says, which literally means the element enters, man does not enter. Which you can interpret to mean anyway, but I like to interpret it to say that let the elements do their thing. This is not where we go and, and, and um, um, interfere with the growth process. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> it's fascinating how you have botany in the Hawaiian language. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll move to our next speaker. And we talked about a little bit about 
um, change and birth and processes and the dynamic earth. And I think our next speaker is going to introduce herself, but she's going to talk about climate change and the impact of climate change on these islands and surroundings. Thank okay. you, Dina. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Hui Hui, for sharing that and the amazing work that the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation is doing. Um, my colleague, Kale uh, Nuhiwa, she is the Indigenous Knowledge Systems Fellow at Conservation International, so she's really helping us integrate knowledge systems into our programming and projects. So thank you so much. I learned a lot. So hi, everybody. My name is Juno Fitzpatrick, and I am the Director of Human Rights and Oceans at Conservation International. And this title might seem like a bit of an odd coupling for some. But within Conservation International, we recognize that the 72% of our planet, our ocean, is in fact peopled seas and peopled coastlines. And understanding and protecting these peopled seas and peopled coastlines is fundamental for effective marine resource management, marine conservation, marine fisheries management, the blue economy, and climate adaptation. So as many folks know in this room um, and probably throughout this conference that our oceans are facing a rising tide of threats from climate change to pollution to overfishing. And these threats imperil the ocean's ability to sustain our lives. And it's our impacts that drive the ongoing degradation of the ocean, but also the ongoing exploitation of the planet's most vulnerable people. So climate change rarely acts in isolation. It interacts with other systemic issues such as poverty, discrimination, and the inequities produce these variegated outcomes for people around the world. So in my short session today, I'm gonna to provide a sort of snapshot of human rights violations specific to Pacific tuna fisheries in the Western Central Pacific Ocean and what this means under changing climate conditions. And then I'll offer a short roadmap to respond. Okay. Ooh. There you go. So I work within our Global Fisheries and Aquaculture Program, and we work in 36 sites across 24 countries. And our team is dedicated to achieving sustainability in Pacific fisheries supporting sustainable production practices that support thriving ocean ecosystems and human well-being across the Western Central Pacific Ocean. And this graphic here, this map, this shows the sites where we're working. And our approach has these two twin pillars of protection and production. And so our protection goal is to double the world's ocean areas that are actively conserved by 2025. And the international NGO community has come together to define the goal for wild capture fisheries. And our contribution is to focus on 20 critical geographies where we have the partnerships in place and programs to drive impact. And so these are the areas in dark blue on this map. So my focus today is Firstly, I want to sort of frame up why are we working on this issue. So the ocean is the biggest food system on the planet. There's three in seven people that depend on the ocean as their primary source of protein, and the seafood sector employs millions. The Western Central Pacific Ocean, this supports the largest tuna fishery in the world, and the importance of fisheries to this region can really not be overstated. The region provides 60% of global tuna supply, and over half of the tuna catch from the Western Central Pacific Ocean comes from the waters of Pacific small island developing states. The tuna industry in the Pacific Islands supports 23,000 jobs, and it's critically important for government revenue for the 10 countries and territories. So we're talking about food security, and we're talking about livelihood security. 
Back uh, a few years ago now, 2019, the Pacific Community, or SPC, alongside Conservation International and Partners, completed a series of analyses to assess the impacts of climate change on tropical tuna species and tuna fisheries in Pacific Island waters and high seas areas. So the map that um, we see on the left, this shows a projected eastward distribution of skipjack and yellowfin tuna due to climate change. So it's expected to reduce the total tuna catch within the combined exclusive economic zones of 10 Pacific Island countries. So in other words, by 2050, under a high greenhouse gas emission scenario, 8.5, the total biomass of three tuna species in the waters of 10 Pacific Island countries and territories, and this is where most per seine occurs, this could decline by an average of 13% due to a greater proportion of fishing in the high seas. This equates to an annual loss of $19 million and reduction in government revenue of 13%. So the projected, the eastward distribution and these projected um, decreases, these are likely to reduce the contribution that tuna fishing licenses makes to government revenue. So climate driven redistribution of tuna threatens to disrupt the economies of Pacific Island small, sorry, <laughs> economies of Pacific small island developing states and the sustainable management of the world's largest tuna fishery. So what we're seeing here is an expected um, reduction in the contribution that the region's tuna resource makes to national development. And so this causes issues around national development, food security and employment and the undermining of human security. So in other words, climate change is fomenting changes in Pacific food webs. And as a result, tuna is on the move from well-managed zones to the lawless high seas. So this is where we see illegal fishing, plastic pollution from fisheries fleets, issues around bycatch and other environmental issues. And this remains a huge threat. But what I also want to pivot to is thinking about the human rights of workers on these vessels and how these supply chains are also under threat. So globally, this interaction of climate change, overfishing, anthropogenic threats, this drives the overexploitation of fisheries and the exploitation of people. And this is not new. Climate change will create and worsen challenges of fairness and equity faced by developing countries, regions and communities reliant on marine livelihoods. So the types of inequities I'm talking about, this is the unfair distribution of commercial fish catches, limited political power of small scale fishers, particularly women and other minority groups, limited engagement of developing nations in high seas activities and associated decision making, and then the consolidated interest of global supply chains in few transnational corporations. And these corporations have evidence of poor transparency and human rights abuses. So these recent media revelations that I've included on this slide, this has really placed social issues at the forefront of a sector that up until recently has exclusively focused on environmental dimensions of sustainability. But human rights violations, labor exploitation, and modern slavery in fishing is pervasive. It occurs in about two thirds of the world's countries with coastlines in the global north and in the global south. And in many of those countries that I highlighted in blue in my previous slide. So just to sort of create this connection between environmental and social impacts, I included an article by Monga Bay on the bottom left. So the title of this article reads, more Indonesian sailors repatriated from deadly Chinese fleet. The returning sailors were trafficked into dangerous and illegal working conditions on board the boats, including 18-hour workdays and being forced to catch and fin sharks, including protected species. So this media coverage and more like it, this demonstrates that social performance within the sector is among, is among one of the worst production sectors on the planet. And with around 200 million people around the world, directly or indirectly, depending on the seafood industry for employment, it is crucial for the seafood sector to catch up. 
For the Pacific region and where we are now, the industrial fishing sector is a high risk sector for forced labor and human trafficking. So when we're thinking about those per sane vessels that are moving out of the exclusive economic zones of Pacific Island countries into the high seas, what's happening aboard these vessels? We see issues of human trafficking, forced labor. And what this means is that if you're discriminated against, treated inhumanely, held against your will, do not have the right to organize, this is a violation of your civil and political rights. And so this type of forced labor and labor exploitation, this has been reported across the Pacific in the waters of Fiji, New Zealand, the United States, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and others. But these deplorable labor conditions are accompanied by less elevated social issues along coastlines, thinking about chronic institutionalized inequality and insecurity. So some people in this room might be why, like, why is Conservation International, an environmental organization, working at the nexus of environmental and human rights? So research has shown a clear link between harmful fishing, habitat destruction, and human rights abuses in global fisheries. And this graphic hopes to break down this problem a little bit. So just to sort of paint a picture, depleted stocks drive increased fishing effort fishing farther, fishing deeper, and fishing longer, and thereby drive costs. This increases the demand for cheap labor to offset the loss in profit. To then compensate for higher costs, vessel owners can turn to illegal trafficking networks to supply cheap labor at the expense of vulnerable populations, often migrant workers. So it's the same factors that enable illegal harvesting and the over-exploitation of a fish stock that also drive human rights abuses in the sector and undermine marine protected areas. And this burden of overexploited fish stocks falls disproportionately on low income and developing countries and vulnerable populations. But what about coastal communities? So more and more coastal communities in the Pacific are experiencing unprecedented rates of, of rates of change and face high levels of uncertainty when it comes to resource av availability, livelihood security, food security, and safety. So the impacts of climate change on coral reefs will significantly impact coastal fisheries and local food security for growing human populations. There is an estimated around 20%, um, sorry, 30% growth in the demand for fish in the Pacific by 2035, coupled with decreasing coastal fish habitats. And this illustrates a precarious food security scenario for Pacific Island countries and territories. So I talked earlier about civil and political rights violations. Economic, social, and cultural rights violations are prevalent in coastal fisheries. And so an example of this is when a foreign fleet overfish in the exclusive economic zone of a developing country, such that fishing as a livelihood or um, a way of life is no longer economically vi viable, or a community's rights to food security are undermined. And collectively, this can drive social instability, poverty, and resource decline. So how are we responding? At CI, our program's crucial focal points are protection, production, and people. And finding the balance here has never been greater. The need to protect critical ocean habitats goes hand in hand with an equal commitment to protect ocean dependent communities and fish workers' human rights. So our program is dedicated to this approach through the development of innovative tools for assessing and improving social performance in tandem with economic and environmental performance in fisheries. Our approach encompasses the protection of civil and political, economic, social, cultural, collective, and indigenous rights, such as the right to food, customary use rights, and a safe working environment. So how are we doing this? We led the development of an agreed upon definition of socially responsible seafood, inclusive of protecting human rights, dignity and access to resources, ensuring equality and equitable opportunity to benefit and improving food and livelihood security. And to institute this, we co-developed the social responsibility assessment tool. This is a screenshot of that here. This is a risk assessment tool as a part of a human rights due diligence process 
which is now being scaled across the Pacific and in the seafood market space. And this really represents a major paradigm shift for the broader ocean sustainability movement to now think about people in addition to fish. So from Costa Rica, Suriname, South Africa, and then in the Pacific, Peru, New Caledonia, the Solomon Islands, the Cook Islands, we are integrating science, and this speaks to the previous presentation, with diversity, equity, and inclusion principles, where we're taking a rights holder-centric approach, ensuring that we're integrating the knowledge systems of those communities and countries. So this means that we ensure free prior and informed consent with local communities and indigenous peoples, and procedural equity when working with fish workers and communities. So just to share, um, one or two stories. So right now in Fiji and New Caledonia, we're piloting this assessment tool with the industrial longline South Pacific albacore tuna fleet as a part of a seascapes approach. And so field teams in Fiji and New Caledonia, they're assessing for human trafficking and forced labor, the treatment of fish workers, safety practices, access to food and first aid, among other key rights and needs in their domestic industry. So right now, actually just last week, um, our Pacific-based country programs are facilitating consultations with a diversity of tuna industry, government, and community stakeholders to co-identify the key environmental, social, and economic issue areas of the distant water and domestic fleets. So as an example of what these priorities are, in New Caledonia, um, the key priority for the customary authority includes the reduction of totemic shark bycatch by the longline fishery and anti-discrimination protections for the indigenous Kanak crew on longline vessels. And so this tool is used to implement this to assess improvement areas. And this then drives the performance of the New Caledonia pelagic fishery, which serves New Cal's 300,000 population, and then the improved management of their 1.3 million kilometer squared coral sea park. So this is just one example of how we're twinning production and protection and trying to improve the management and procedural equity within that management um, across the Pacific. So just to wrap up, I want to kind of situate this work a little bit in where we're at now um, under COVID and under this pandemic. And so we've seen that under COVID, there was a relaxation of human observer requirements. There was a reduction in at sea enforcement capacity. There was increased rates of transshipment. And this exacerbated this positive feedback loop of harmful fishing and exploitation of people. And this had dire consequences for many people working at sea. So we need to pay attention to the lessons that we've learned um, from COVID-19 and the market disruptions. Vulnerable groups, women, children, migrant workers, indigenous peoples, they're experiencing COVID impacts disproportionately. So in addition to these structural inequities, COVID interacts with chronic and acute climate stresses to increase vulnerabilities of coastal communities to food and livelihood security. So our community of practice within the NGO, government, industry world, we're at a critical junction to implement effective tools to protect fishers and workers, civil, political, economic, social, cultural, collective, and indigenous rights, and to collaborate with business and human rights partners to embed social improvements to de-risk supply chains and facilitate some nature positive solutions. So, um, yeah, if anyone would like to hear more about our human rights program, um, you can speak to me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Juno. That's a really nice transition to our next speaker, who is going to give examples of integrating research and indigenous knowledge here in Hawaii. Yeah. Aloha, so Kako. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Let's try that again. Aloha, Kako. Aloha. Um, so my name is Pelika Andrade. I am. Um, I have two formal hats. Uh, Namaka Onauna. I'm the executive director for the nonprofit Namaka Onauna, and I'm also an extension agent for the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Where do I point it? There we go. So I, before I get into kind of some of the tools that I want to share with you today, 
um, I wanted to share just one of our broader programs. So one of our broader programs is called Nakilo Aina, and it loosely translates into observers of the many things that feed us. And like Hui, Hui was able to do, we're gonna give you a little bit of some language lessons. So Kilo, um, if you hang around in Hawaii a little bit, you'll hear this word over and over again now. And it's used to talk about watching and, and observing. But Kilo also is this other step of analysis, right? We have other words for watching and listening. Kilo is this identifying the dots and seeing how they relate and they connect and the stories that they tell. Aina is loosely translated and used to talk about land, but that's one, one translation. Aina is all of those things that feed us. And if we talk about feedings and the necessity of feedings, it's feedings of our body, mind, and soul. So what are these Aina? What are these bases of feeding that contribute? And like Aloha, it is, is, it's reciprocal. So our relationship with Aina is that of reciprocity. The things that we expect to feed us, we have to feed in return. And that's the value, that's the quality of the feeding that come, that, that goes back and forth. So Nakilo Aina and this larger umbrella program is observers of the many things that feed us. How do we understand those stories of those things that feed us? And then how do we bring our communities into that story and into those conscious places? Again, I just wanna kind of go into goals and what, what's the end goal of all of this? And for our programs and for a lot of us in indigenous communities, we're talking about Aina Momona broadly, which I loosely translate into thriving and productive communities. Yeah, that's the end goal. We, we have fishery issues, we have watershed issues, we have water quality issues, but all of those goals are met if we have thriving communities. So they are byproducts of a much larger goal of the, the equity in so our social areas, our political, our natural worlds, right? So really kind of pushing that forward within the end goal of the work that we do. I do wanna um, touch on community. When I talk about community, we're talking about the people, the place, and the things and resources that exist in that space. Um, we, we talked about Akua, the elementals. That's all our community. Those are our community members. They're from family members. So let's get into some of our, um, our Nakilo Aina, our what are we looking at and what are we, um, what are we trying to pull from, from the world around us, from our communities. And one of the things that um, my father's an educator as well that he talks about is our landscapes are the knowledge repositories right how do we how do we read that library and for a lot of us because of the media and and our relationships that we have in our present day we we've forgotten how to read that library right so trying to go back to a place having a story and relearning how to listen to that story the other challenge that we have is also revisiting and redefining the narratives and the beliefs that we hold that aren't necessarily the stories that we're hearing from a place because they're filled with all of these other stories that we've been fed, either through our genealogies, through our histories, through the politics of the day, through other interpretations and value systems, right? So trying to revisit and redefine those narratives and beliefs. And these pictures give a really, really great example. So this is the same shoreline taken at different times of year. And I've asked this over the past 10 years, what month is healthy? And a lot of people talk about March being the healthy month, right? Shake your head if you think March is healthy. Yeah, so that's the belief. The thing is all the months are healthy, right? But if we go in with the belief that March is healthy and we go to October, which is the bottom right picture, what kind of damage can we as managers, as users as family members do to that shoreline if we are still striving for our belief of what healthy is instead of really understanding the depths of what that story is of our places. So huli ia is a tool that we've worked on and you guys have heard this word huli before, right? Huli a lot in, in um, what hui hui was talking about. In the context of how the use of, of this tool, huli also means to, it means to change, to turn, to search. So it's, it's 
for us, it was a way to, how do we change how we listen? How do we change how we view the world around us? How do we change that? And how do we search for those stories and listen as, as cleanly as possible? And it never becomes 100% clean, but trying to. Letting a place contribute to its own narrative instead of through the lens and through the beliefs and through the, through the stories that we have playing in our head. Yeah. The other thing with Huli'ia is unlike most of what we in present day find valuable, which is the record, right? What we can put down on paper, what we can publish. That is not our end goal of Huli'ia. It's one of, a, it's a product of, but it's not the end goal. Because if we force our people to go through these, not force, if we engage and we support our people to go into these other processes, we build capacity of our people to be aware and to listen. We build the capacity to remember and our brains are not used to the capacity in that way because we write everything down, unfortunately, right? Building capacity to internalize, analyze, and process the story of our place and to sit in it and really, really engage in that. And also to build Pilina, which is that relationship, that living, breathing relationship that we have with our community at large. So this is a really, really old data sheet because we were trying to like squish in our notes as we had a discussion. So it's changed, but that's kind of an area of what we talk about. So a big part of Huli'ia is engaging our memories through conversation. And the conversation is really, really important. So we also don't ask people to go off to the side and kind of note down what they see, because if you note down what you see, you only see what you see and you'll never broaden your capacity to listen. But if you sit down with 10 people, there is probably a 100% chance that every person will add one observation that you have never seen before. As a sailor, I see the wind different from a farmer. As a surfer, I see the waves different from a sailor, right? So every experience brings another view into the world. And as long as you can have that conversation, you start to build the capacity to listen without having to live their life and their experience. And then by not writing it down, so here's the thing, we have a fear of loss. If we don't write it down, we fear, we fear we lose it. But if we write it down, we never remember it. So I also, as an educator, try to get my students to not bring notebooks, not write anything down, because I would rather let them build a strong relationship with four facts from and a visit, then walk away writing down a hundred and, and not knowing any. And if they can build four by four by four by four, at the end of a year, their relationship has grown and their ability to listen has grown. So as we recalibrate ourselves to the world around us, trying to get rid of not only the beliefs and the narratives that we have playing in our head, but also allowing a place to tell us their story, so in Hawaii, as well as other indigenous places around the world, cultures around the world, we are related to our environment and the elementals, as Hui Hui says. And they are the eldest of within our families. Shouldn't we listen to them? Skip the generations sometimes, because sometimes they're skewed through those generational biases. What are they telling us? And most of the time they're telling us the same thing, but for that small chance that something else is happening, that's kind of the, um, how do we find that? And one other thing that I really like to touch on is, as, as a Native Hawaiian, I'm not supposed to see what my ancestors saw. I'm supposed to see how they saw. Our storytellers in our library have changed. We have different storytellers. They're still telling a story. Yeah, we have different plants, we have different animals, we have different kinds of weather patterns, we have different kinds of clouds that are coming during different times of the year. I'm not going to see the exact same thing as my kupuna, my ancestors, but I can see it through the lens of how they saw it. Oh, let me go back. So there's these processes. So we ask people, what's happening? How do you, how do you, how, do, how are the clouds behaving? How are the winds behaving? And we try to separate it out of cause and effect, right? People go, oh, well, it's really, really cold. We have a north wind because we have a front coming in. Well, how do you know you have a front? Did you see the front? And part of that challenge is trusting your own eyes, ears, smell, touch, and intuition. The other is someone else told you that. We want you to tell us that. Yeah, so what you see, 
and separate it out of what the story, what the connection is. Because we already know what that connection potentially could be. But we also don't know if it's the true connection or it's taken out of context of someone else's connection. So in this one capture of a season, we had a lot of salty sea breeze. And over here we have Ehukai. It covers, it's like the sea fog. And sometimes depending on the valleys, it'll, it'll look just like fog. You can't see across the base. So this was one of those months we had a lot of that flowering of plants. Our shoreline smelled like limu and some of our fishes were reproducing fat gonads. And those are our storytellers. And then we have this visual story that happens across the year. You can't really see it well. We've done this with two communities to be able to kind of let that story as cleanly as we could listen. And again, we're amateurs here, right? We'll always be amateurs, I think, but we're trying to build that skill of what that story looks like. So this is a like little close up, right? Look at the colors of that sunrise and sunset. They change through time and how it correlates with the growth and shrinkage of that intertidal zone on the shoreline. There's a correlation in that story. They might not be cause and effect, but they definitely happen and are driven by the same factors. And then we get to do what our ancestors did. Pass on knowledge through bits of information that were easy to remember. We have this over time, right? They pass this information. Now we get to give them 2015 to our, to our children. So Kipi'ina Nalu Ulupapo Haku Pulukapapa A Ulukapahe'e talks about the boulder crashing waves and that's the time to go and get this really delicious seaweed that you only see in that slice of time when those elements are happening. And then we also got to work with the state of Hawaii DLNR up at Kure Atoll and do the same thing there. And one of them, the middle one, um, and ever ever our Sudi turn. So when the Sudi turn starts to arrive in big droves, right, in huge flocks, soon winter will be gone. So as they start to come, we know we're transitioning into summer. So once we understood kind of, okay, we gotta listen to seasons. We gotta figure this out. How does the world around us inform us? we have another cycle happening. So we have seasonal cycles, and then we also have moon cycles happening. We have, we know that moon, the moon phases affect us in very different ways. Our ancestors knew that, they planted, they fished, and, the, and they were directed by the moon. But what did I say before, right? Not what they saw, but how they saw. The circumstances they lived in are a little different from now. So we'll find some similar, and we might find some different. So what is the, what is my, so we went into what is my personal story with the moon, right? Individually, how does the moon now affect me? And what narratives, right? What does healthy look like? What do I carry around in me to believe that I'm healthy? Are there really non-productive times? Are we really unhealthy? And then every state has an element and function that supports productivity and health. Remember, Aina Momona, right? How do we do productive and thriving communities? And Aina being us, starting with us, we are Aina bases because we feed. Our job is to feed. And the ability for us to feed depends on the ability to be fed back in return. So we are not meant to be happy all the time. We are meant to experience every emotion fully and deeply so we can truly grow. Think about it, sunshine all the time makes a desert, right? So talk, think about the things that we are told are negative, sadness right? Laziness. Have we ever tried to flip the script and talk about how those things are actually really huge contributors to a healthy state? I like to say my, my Netflix marathons are very, very productive. And they are because they rest my brain and they rest my body and they give me another boost for something else. They're super productive in the scheme of a larger window and frame time, time frame. So in order to like really just geek out on this and really understand it, I cut up a tide calendar with the moon. So that's one whole year, January at the top to um, December at the bottom, which is not our Hawaiian year, but close enough. And that's the new moon all the way to the left and the goes in the middle is the full moon and then all the way to the right is going back to the new moon. 
and you can see across the moon phases, there are some similarities across the moon phases as you go down across the year, but they change seasonally. So moon phase affects us within the context of season. And that's some things that we're forgetting to put actions into the context of seasons. There's two cycles happening. So as an example for tides, how it affects that across the year is our new moons, full moons, the similarity across the year is that the highest high and the lowest low are the farthest apart on those moons. The cool thing is, if you can see the green circles and the red circles, those are the only times of the year that we go into extreme high tides and extreme lows. And that's winter during new moons and full moons and summer during new moons and full moons. Only time in this calendar. Another really cool thing that's happening is we have Ole moons, those are the first and third quarter moons. And there's like a pen circle, kind of, if you can see it, can you see that pen circle? I don't know if this has a pointy. Anyway, there's what I call my scientific word for it is mushing. Instead of having two tides, two highs and two lows, we have one extremely high and one extreme long low. And that only happens in what we call our Ole moons in the spring and the fall. And I think the function of that is to throw our tides off because the cool thing about our highs and our lows is we have the highest of high tides happen in the winter, in the morning time, and in the summer, in the afternoons. So we have a swapping of when we see high our extreme highs and lows. So that's another cool thing, right? Within the context of season. So if we can look at the tides being affected this way by the moon and season, now what is it doing for our personal tides? So partnered with my friend Naya Lewis with Salted Logic, this beautiful human being and artist, and we developed this Kuumo'olelo'onapo'kamahina, which is just talking about what is my personal story to the days of the, the nights of the moon or the phases of the moon. Because we wanted to help set people off on their own voyage of discovery with their own relationship and the story that they have in relationship with to the moon. On top of that, we wanted to be like, look at quantitative measures. So we took kino, which is your physical, so we equate that to physical energy, mana'o, which is mental clarity, na'o, which is emotional, spiritual resilience, and then there's gender cycles, um, attraction, universal attraction, that's, you know, when you're driving down the road and you hit every green light, and then you get the parking spot in front of the store, right? Really, really great universal attraction. And then you hit every red light and then the auntie yells at you, right? You get those, that's the lower end of the spectrum. And then I've also found through, but there's also a body image fluctuation that happens. So we wanted to go and kind of look at that through the lens of title charts. So three is your normal. And we didn't want to use negative words, so it's like lower resilience, lower energy, lower clarity, and then upper. And then remember I was telling you in those full and new moons in the winter and summer, we have those extremes. So we save zero and six for that, but you're supposed to fluctuate between one and five. So to be um, fair, I did this with 135 people a couple years ago, and then I'm sharing mine because if I ask other people to share personal information, I share mine. So this is my title chart when it comes to those first three, Kino, Mana'o, and Nao. And those are my windows. So I have the, in the green, I've labeled my cocky window, right? That's when I have a lot of energy, I'm mentally clear, and I have emotional resilience, so I can do whatever. I don't get sad fast, people can't hurt my feelings very often, right? That's when I charge. And then there's a stewing window. So after all of that stimulation, there's just too much information. You can't put two and two together for me. So I gotta sit in in a while. I can't force anything to connect. So I just let it happen. That's when I take long walks and just let things come in and out of my head. I do things that don't require a lot of sense, if you will. And then after that happens, I have my stars align window, where after all that stewing, all the stars align. And then I can sit down and actually put them down. And because my physical, energy levels are pretty like average low, I don't want to jump out of my own skin and get going. What I found is talking to other people is that everyone has similar windows. They're just happening at different times. There's some overlap and there's not overlap. 
I put the bottom, communion guided by kupuna, because sadness, we talk about the narrative of sadness. If we could change that into a productive idea, right? When you, if, if you ever want to go down the rabbit hole, go look into sadness and sad songs and all of that. There's this really beautiful thing that happens when you sit in that space. And if we teach our, our kids and our families to not be scared of it, there's beautiful things that come of it. That's the part of creation. That's the part where we are the closest to our ancestors. So anyway, so what does this all mean for education, mental health, autism, endless possibilities? If we can find big windows where the whole student body is going up physically, shouldn't we change our academic calendar to do, to do physical activities and optimize their production, right? I know Momona, thriving. If they are optimizing and all the stars align in this nice window, wouldn't that be a great time to hold SATs? <laughs> are we holding SATs at the other time when they shouldn't be aligned, right? So how are we not paying attention to the systems and how our kupuna saw our history, uh, saw the world and related to the world to guide their behaviors? And I think that's the lesson that I pull away from my kupuna, is how do I take the lessons that guided their life for the, to optimize production, to optimize thriving, and flush it through today's, today's world and today's families and today's individuals to help us optimize our production and change some narratives that are really not our own. Change what we believe is healthy. Change what we believe is productive, right? Five reports done, check, productive. Is that really productive? And if you haven't done it, is it really not productive? Netflix, remember that. So I'm just gonna get through this. Part of, I know I'm over time, I'm sorry. The journal, so there's an opportunity, especially for our women, I find men don't wanna do this, but the women will, to really just talk about our, our talk about what we're feeling. Like I have, I've, I've made up my own terms for things like I'm feeling precious today, right? Um, right, make up whatever, cause it's your journal, it's your journey. And this is one moon phase. So over the every month, you write on the same page. And after three or four months, you're gonna go through it with a highlighter and you're gonna find that you're using the same words over and over and over again. So not only can you graph things, but you can actually start to pull out what kinds of, where you know you are. So when I'm feeling disconnected from the world, I don't wanna go and just have a pity party because I just know that's the moon phase is that window that I sit in at that time. And I'm not so hard on myself because that is a window, by the way. So here's some geeky stuff you can do with it at the end, right? You can write down your summaries, you can graph your, your tides, if you will, um, and looking at what kinds of things you find just in Kino and Na'o and, and Mana'o. And then um, my, my friend is um, Naya has also just started iMahina, um, so it's an app online too. But, but, that's, but that's me, thank you. Thank you, Pelika. Well, a lot to think about. <laughs> yes, yeah, we speed dated through that one. And our next speakers are going to share how they actually facilitate conversation with youth and talk about all of these things. Oh, come on. <laughs> Magoo, come join. Both of you can stand here. Okay, well, that is so much to unpack, and actually, I think we've just changed our entire talk. Can we do that? Oh, well, we can add some things into it in any case. Listen to the tides. You're I'm listening. I just listened. <laughs> um, I just wanted to reflect on a, a couple of things that we're going to be talking about as we go through our work here, which we'll introduce in just a minute. Um, one of them was, is the importance of language and how language reflects so much and really serves the needs of the people in place. Um, language is itself a descriptor, and we've heard talk about libraries and reading, reading nature, reading um, the world around us, and language in so many ways does that. It is science. Language actually is science. 
And as we impose languages across the world and lose languages across the world, we are changing the way stories are told about our environment. And that's, um, we're losing a lot in that sense. Um, we've also heard about the importance of integrating knowledge systems, and so we're going to talk to you more about that today. Um, so uh, I'm Nicole Crane. I'm Magul. This is Magul, and we are with an organization called One People, One Reef, and we're going to be talking with you today about how we've been in, uh, integrating knowledge systems in our work in the Western Pacific, um, partnerships for sustainability, and I think more to the point, really, um, how we are working to create authentic collaboration around resource protection, food security, and cultural integrity. Um, I'm, I'm reflecting on some of the language that you were mentioning through Conservation International and, and the importance of integrating these knowledge systems. I think really one of the things we're going to talk about, and it's a challenge for all of us, is how do we do that? Um, we've heard about the tuna fishery and how it affects so many people, one fishery, even though it's a big one, we're going to be talking about how a very few people are impacting a massive area of ocean um, and how we're working with that. So let's go. Um, we first want to express our deep appreciation for the people of Yap. We're working in the Yap Outer Islands um, for sharing so much, including this story. We have some of the room with us today. Um, so we just want to extend our appreciation to the people that we work with. Um, just a brief introduction to some of the members of our team here. I'm Michelle Paddock, um, Magul, myself, Peter Nelson, um, Giacomo, and so many others that we work with across the islands. This is a true collaborative effort, and I want to make sure that's articulated because this is not a piece of work that any of us own. Um, it is, of course, an important academic endeavor, but much more important than that is it's an endeavor to work with people to meet goals that all of us have. So again, our deep appreciation to the many different um, communities that we've worked with to help us create the story that we're going to be telling today. So I'm going to start off here with just where, where we are. Um, we are in the Federated States of Micronesia, Yap in particular, um, the Outer Islands of Yap in particular. Um, Yap is um, in the Western Pacific, and it is the staging area, Ulithi Atoll, where we're working in particular here. Um, there it is up there in the upper left of your screen, um, where James Cameron staged his Challenger Deep expeditions, because it is the closest landmass to the Marianas Trench, very deep, deep water. Um, this is a, just a picture here, satellite image of Ulithi Atoll, so we'll be talking about the work that we've done on this atoll in particular, although our work has also extended through the Outer Islands. The governance context in um, the Outer Islands, and in particular in Ulithi, is a unique one, so we really don't mean to say that the model that we're presenting here today is applicable everywhere. However, we do think that there are elements of what we're doing that are transferable across regions, across disciplines, um, and have to do with all levels of collaboration around the environment and conservation. So the, the governance context is that these islands are essentially autonomously governed, which means that local chiefs and local leaders can make decisions about management, conservation, um, and even who comes in to work with them um, by themselves. So it's, it's a, it is a different context than most of the world. Um, our work really is based in the central idea that collaboration is needed to understand and solve complex environmental challenges. Our planet is facing some serious ones, as we know, and some of those are not local in context, although many have, all, all of them, of course, have local ramifications. But to understand and solve and address the issues, it takes all of us. And science and scientists are increasingly working throughout the world to try to address these global problems, and I think in many cases don't necessarily understand the impacts that their science is having, whether it be conservation or otherwise. And I think they are not always aware that when working with indigenous peoples and in other people's lands and seas, um, there is a level of respect and understanding that can both augment and support their work, um, but also extremely important for local people. And, and I don't think that scientists are doing their work um, with ill intentions in any way. I think oftentimes there's a lack of understanding of how to do it that way. Um, it isn't simple, but it is doable. So we, we know that coral reefs are threatened, and I think we often don't sit back. I think 
the speakers here today, I think, are deeply rooted in this, but cultures and languages and traditional knowledge tied to reefs are threatened as well. And within that is a body of knowledge that is vast and deep and can inform all of us on this planet if we work together. So we, we want to make sure we sort of bring this into this conversation about language. Um, words are extremely important. Um, words conservation, management, and stewardship have different meanings for different people. And definitions affect people because definitions are what frame how we work, the questions we ask, the data we collect, and what we do with it. So these definitions drive our science. And if we aren't thinking about what the definitions are in the context of the people whose places we are working, then I think we aren't doing our due diligence as Western scientists. Um, for example, the term conservation is a term that um, we don't use in our work because to the many of the people in the outer islands, that term can have, can be a threat. Um, conservation means, you know, protect 30% by 2030 means what? Take it away, um, close it. Um, put it aside. So these are people whose livelihoods depend on fishing and accessing this resource. Uh, and so the word conservation might to one group mean I want to protect it because it's beautiful, I want to protect it because it has an ecosystem service, I want to protect it so I can go there on vacation, I want to protect it because I can take data from it, so this is important for a baseline study let's say. Um, but those may be reasons for protecting that are very different uh, than that for people who might be relying on that resource. So this is a thought that we had sort of talked about together. Um, there's, there's two sides to this. Uh, one is that um, Western conceived conservation, as I was just talking about, and, and a lack of awareness of the cultural context of that. Um, but the other is local communities and their awareness of the impacts of Western technologies that they might be incorporating or using. I think so we have some examples, some ideas. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me let me say uh, this because I think we owe that to the land and the and the culture. Suro, suro to the space, suro to the land of Hawaii, suro to the ancestors and the spirits that first made this connection from Micronesia, particularly Yap and the Hawaiian community. Uh, our respect to you, first of all. Um, I represent a very small community, a uh, group of community indigenous people. Um, the, the, those of you may have heard of uh, Papa Mao, who uh, came across from Yap many, many years ago. So our work, our efforts, is trying to connect with you on a slightly different level, not just the skill, um, but the systems, some of the systems that make life uh, survive on this island. And as we hear climate change, as we hear all of these many challenges that are global, um, I just want to start off by saying that we are here to ask collaborators of world citizens to try to solve bigger issues. Let's not forget that at the end of every single box, there's people's lives that are affected by decisions we make every day. So I'll start with that, and then we'll talk about um, uh, some of the examples of what we mean by the two sides, conservation from a West science base and what that means on a traditional level. Um. So the first story we're going to tell is that of grouper conservation, where mm -hmm. Western science has shown clearly these are vulnerable fish, they're case selected, um, overfishing um, causes them to decline in ways that make it difficult for them to come back. Um, so behind that Western science, is a huge volume of information um, from local and traditional fishing practices. And I just want to say also that, that some of the context of what we talk about is in the context of young people who are losing some of their knowledge of these traditions, which are not just traditions and taboos, they are in fact an integrated and embedded conservation system, both a language system and a practice system. Um, so we'll talk a bit about the, the grouper example. Um, so I. Let me, can I add a little bit about the science? So, so in our communities, there's been many groups, of conservation or um, climate change uh, folks that come out and talk about the bigger global picture. And so you hear the science, yes, it's great from a science uh, perspective, 
But how do we translate that, let's say, in fish management into a local? How does that translate into a, a culture that depends on it for food, for example? So with us, it may not always be as clear. So maybe it's in the taboos. Yeah, there's taboos that believe that uh, we believe then that protected that resource, for example. And as we learn from, uh, as we now go to Western schools and are forced to speak English and think to some degree in the way English is spoken or larger area um, uh, languages are spoken, goes the taboo. We start stop believing in the taboo and then goes the conservation that goes with that taboo. And so we'll give a couple group, um, couple examples of that, for example. Where's so in the grouper example, um, we were asked early on in some of our work, why, why are the large grouper reserved for the chiefs? Like that, that seems like a silly thing. Um, chiefs don't necessarily deserve it, <laughs> some of the comments that we got from some of the younger people. Um, but in fact, many grouper are hermaphroditic, and many of them are sequentially hermaphroditic, meaning they turn from one sex to the other throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, the larger ones are female, and in others, the larger ones are male. In both cases, protecting the larger one is protecting the reproductive output for the population, um, depending on what reproductive life history strategy that they have. So that, that taboo in itself is a huge conservation measure because people don't want to catch the large grouper because then you have to give it up to the chief and you have to take it there in the first place. You have to come in early so it stays fresh. There's all kinds of hassle to doing that. So this is a built-in mechanism. Um, so that was one example that, that became really clear to us as we were talking to people throughout the islands. This is another one that I suppose has one of the largest impacts. Um, and this is that spear guns have become um, heavily used in the outer islands. Um, these came from Hawaii, and I don't mean that they came from Hawaii like traditionally or culturally, but they like, physically came from Hawaii for the most part. Um, and Guam, and this had a huge impact on the ecosystems. Um, and, and as Magul points out, that for many of the young people today, spear guns are traditional because it's been there ever since they were little, so they don't understand this, this uh, um, gap necessarily. Um, so here's a, say. So this is a, a catch of male parrotfish right here. Um, so, uh, terminal male parrotfish. Um, parrotfish, of course, are, are herbivores on reefs. They have an uh, important role in maintaining habitat for corals. So, this is a spear fish caught a um, bunch of parrotfish here. And um, we see that, that this is impacting the reefs in huge ways. Um, motor boats have also mm -hmm. had a massive impact um, mm -hmm. compared to canoes. Um, Magul's going to talk about fishing jurisdictions and this impact. And so, while we do have a management um, management for canoes be, um, that shifted to boats, we can manage that because we're, we're familiar with vessels, canoes versus boat. We do not have a management for motor boats that could go to any area at any time of the year faster than the canoes. And so this is a, a, a diagram of the jurisdictions, of fishing jurisdictions within Ulithia Atoll, for example. So the red belongs to Falalap, for example, the top green to the upper area, Momo, and the, this one here below. So when you have a boat, uh, in the old days it's canoes, but now with boat, we have a management for that boat access. For example, the boat from Falalap can go only to certain areas down below, right? Um, but now you have um, areas that would be rough during certain times of the year that we cannot access by canoes, so it did not necessarily have a uh, management to to manage that place because you're not supposed to go there at a certain time of the year because you had canoes. Now you have boats that can go anywhere, anytime, and come back in a day. And to couple that, let's put freezers in the mix so now you can get more than you need and store it for longer. So the point here is the technology and how that's affecting a system that's based on a traditional management, not necessarily obvious. To the younger people. So this comes back to the point we made earlier, which is that it's not only a matter of, um, of what the West is doing to indigenous mm. cultures in terms of what they're bringing in, but it's also a matter of indigenous peoples understanding the impact of these Western technologies mm. in their own systems and, and to their own resource management. Um, for the spear guns, for example, there is no traditional system for managing them. 
So to bring back a traditional system doesn't include spear guns. So how do you incorporate that mm -hmm. into management? So this goes back to my point earlier about this combination of, of knowledge systems. Um, it's, it's really solving problems together. And some of those problems are new and they don't exist in either system. So to come together to try to identify what those problems are and to try to figure out what some solutions are. I'm just gonna show you a few data graphs because I know these can get long. So I'm just gonna go through them very quickly. Um, this just shows you the, the green arrows there are pointing to herbivorous fish in Micronesia. So it's a big problem and almost all of those are caught by spear gun. Um, here is a graph from Ulithi. The lowest bar there is the catch by spear. And so you can see hook and line and spear are the two largest forms of catching fish. Spear guns, which is the lowest bar, um, catch the most fish. And this graph shows that spear guns are catching those red fish in the middle. And although those are Ulithian names, I will tell you <laughs> those are um, almost all, except for one or two, I believe, herbivorous fish. So that problem is directly connected to spear guns. Um, this is just a graph of data showing that fish biomass at different sites is very different, as is coral cover at different sites. So this won't surprise any of you. But it does paint a picture of the different resource availability and the different habitat types, um, both biological and, um, and non-biological. Abiotic and biotic factors are different. So this affects fishing and it affects resource management. We've discovered this sort of interesting weedy coral that's taking over fishing sites and causing a lot of problems for people. Um, it's a story we're telling together with the people of Ulithi because neither of us understand it. So we're beginning to understand this coral using genetics and genomics. Genomics is also helping us understand population structure of this coral. So we're using sort of Western science methods to tell stories that are impacting local people. I'm going to let Magul quickly tell this story because this is a really interesting one about connectivity and some of the social impacts of the science and data we've been collecting. Yeah, and to lead up to that, all that science was, we were terrified with all that science from the beginning of this project, this effort. You know, we had to interpret it to, to understand, try to understand that through many, many means, different means to be able to understand that. And one example we're going to share with you today is the example of connectivity. And the point is, there are many issues today that are not tradition. Um, as she said before, it's not, we're not supposed to see it through the lens of the ancestors, but how they saw it. So how we see it today is there's many, many issues that are much more global that, that cannot be solved by just our own taboo tradition base. So one example is connectivity. We, we traditionally, these islands, different jurisdiction that you saw earlier are managed separately by different clans. So what the science did was we collect these uh, samples and show DNA of how, who in the atoll, which communities in the atoll are actually sharing fish. Because if they're sharing fish, chances are they're sharing pollution as well. And so what does that mean to a system that's not designed for that? It has led to youth interest and communities forcing to cross those um, traditional lines and talk to each other. Because now we cannot manage alone, we have to work with each other. So I love that story because it was a, a eye opening for, for us and an example of working together collaboratively, the science and the tradition and coming up with newer ways for newer issues. Okay, so I'm going to go quickly now. This is a management plan that the community of Falalip came up with. And so I just want to make a point here mm. that um, as a Western, as a team of Western scientists, mm. we never propose management plans. Um, we never suggest marine protected areas or any other kind of management. Um, what we do is support communities in providing data to help them tell their own stories and produce their own management plans. So this is a management plan of the island of Falalip, and this is what it resulted in. So 2012 to 2013, that's fish biomass. And you can see how quickly the fish biomass bounced back up and actually remained high even after a typhoon and um, um, a bunch of other social issues, which we're not going to talk about now. But <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so you can see how quickly that management action resulted in higher fish biomass. And, and that was really, um, I think, inspiring for all of us. Mm -hmm. OK, we're not going to talk more about those because we're running out of time. Um, but ultimately, I think in, in this work, what we're talking about here is this collaboration um, and having communities and their needs as the focus and lead to support their management decisions. I think very often when we talk about collaboration, we talk about inviting communities to the table 
about inviting communities to as stakeholders to make sure they have agency in a project, but that, that whole terminology is about inviting people to something that we are creating or we are leading. And what we are really trying to emphasize here is that we need to be supporting what these people want to do on their own. And in this way, it's going to be creating um, it's going to be creating systems that are sustainable because as soon as we leave, if we are quote unquote in charge, then, then they have, there's really no reason for it to be sustained, especially if it's not working because that actually reinforces a reason not to. So um, it's just shifting the way we, we see how collaboration works and being really mindful of whose table we're sitting at, who's laying out the language um, that we're all discussing and what are the goals. Okay, I think the uh, youth are so important, so we're running out of time. So youth are really critical to this whole effort, and um, there we go, we'll end with that one. So at the end of every research and conservation project are people, as Magul mentioned um, in the very start of our, of our talk. Okay, we'll end with our, our funders. Oh, I just, you know what, yeah, I, I do want to say this, because this is actually exactly yeah. what I was saying. Um, for all of us sitting at this table, the questions we need to ask each other are, for whom is this work being done? Why is this work being done? Does it need to be done now? And what is the future long term of this work and its, impl imp and its implementation? I'm thinking really mindfully about the value systems, who's leading it, and what are the roles. And I think these are not always really laid out in a way that involves all parties thinking through them. Now, now we'll end. There. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all went over, didn't we? That's fine. We still have half an hour for questions. Oh, good. Yes, okay. We're good. We're so, no, that's okay. No, no, you, there's enough. Will you try to join us so we can all sit together? So, we're in your culture, ladies first. <laughs> I, I want to start with a question to give people in the audience time to think about their own questions. And if anybody has questions, just line up in front of the microphone and ask as you go. Um, are, there's people monitoring the Zoom, and if there's questions there, they will stand up and ask them as well. So I just want to actually start with a question where Nicole went too fast and stopped talking about the youth. <laughs> and my, my question is, and it's, I know it's a big question and you may need to kind of take a minute to think about it because I had to think a lot about it and I don't know what my answer would be. You know, the earth is dynamic, it's changing. Are the way we look at it is changing. The way people looked at it in the past was different, but the future is in our youth. They're going to be here, and we want to make sure that they have something to look at and appreciate. And if you had one sentence or one advice to give this community here, the youth, your people, anyone in the world about what to do or what you think should be done in order to move forward in the right direction, what would that be? I would say we cannot tell them the story. We have to create it with them so they feel a part of it. Okay. Other speakers, maybe? Same question? Yeah. I, forgot, I lost my tra train of thoughts now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, you know, get creative and talk to each other with a people focus at the center. Uh, oftentimes I think we forget that. And I think if we, we keep the humanity of, of it all, I think that could go cross-cultural and cross-generational, I think. So keep talking to each other. That means stop looking at your little <laughs> devices and make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from anybody in the room? Yeah. 
Yeah, I would just like to say thank you for the, the, the very different perspectives that each of you presented. Um, and so I was just wondering about um, YAP as compared to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And if you could think about those differing contexts and share any mutual wisdom from those two different contexts, like YAP being smaller, Hawaii being bigger. Is there anything to learn from each other or from both of both contexts? Is that your question? I'm gonna just say something. Yes, yes. You can take the microphone there. Um, so one of the things that I really like to talk about when we ask those kinds of questions is to not really nitpick in the weeds of it all. Mm -hmm. Like there's products and then there's systems. I mm -hmm. think indigenous people across the world share, I know Momona, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was about production and thriving and longevity. And I think those are the lessons that we all share. We share with Yap, we share with um, cultures around the world. How it happens will change and the mm -hmm. tools we use will change. And we can use the same tools, we can use different tools, but that thriving and that production is important and our people I can't talk about other indigenous people, but especially in Hawaii and the Pacific, we come from ocean people. We've, we've jumped, if, so we have two genealogies. We have the genealogy that ties us to Halao Nakalao Kapalili, which is our, our deep roots to this place. We come from this earth, from these islands. We were born and raised here. If you ask us where we're from, we're from here. And then we have another genealogy of migration and that migration concentrated a type of person that exists within the Pacific. Because in order to leave land, if you're a sailor, you have to have a lot of faith that you would reach another shore. You have to be innovative, adaptive, and resilient. And you take the cream of that crop that left the Western Pacific and jumped into the islands and they settled. And then the cream of that crop that jumped into the Pacific further and then settled. So we have this genetic concentration of people in the Pacific that were innovative, resilient, adaptable, and had utmost faith that our ancestors would take us someplace where we're supposed to be. And I think that's, for me, in the larger scheme of things, besides the, the individual things, like understanding that green parrot fish are really important <laughs> in the scheme of a fishery. But if you don't have it, then it's not a tool. But understanding what production looks like and optimizing that, being resilient, being adaptable, being innovative and, and really diving deep into that tradition, uh, if that answers any of that. To, to follow up on that before Nicole answers as well, how, how do we give this knowledge to the youth? They have to earn it. So <laughs> we don't give no. it to them. They have to earn it. They, like I know, I, I agree with that. But how do you motivate them to want to earn it? I think include them in the story, like she said. That's my. Mm -hmm. I would. I would. Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't say anything. I agree with that. They have to be included in the story. Do you guys? You can move the oh, microphone oh, oh. over. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> I just I want to say that um, just in direct answer to that question, I think there's so much we can all teach each other. And I think across Pacific Islands that do share certainly what you're talking about in terms of their connection to ocean, place, stewardship. Um, some cultures have had more taken away than others in terms of that knowledge and in terms of the oppressive systems that have um, changed, changed the management schemes. Just to focus on that because there's so much to unpack in that. Um, there is something we can learn. One thing we can learn is what it's like to have had it all taken away and to try to come back. One thing we can learn by we, I mean together, working together, um, is what it's like to be in the beginning of that process, just having it leave, but, but largely intact. And so, I think there's a lot of learning that can be done between those two. And we're actually in the middle of a youth camp right now that's addressing some of those issues. But um, I, I know you've got a couple of words to say about that because. I, you know, we've been working with youth in, in the islands for a couple of years now. And, and this trip 
it's the first time I'm bringing youth from Yap to, to collaborate with uh, the Hawaiian uh, youth here uh, in Mililo'i um, this past week and we'll be spending another week. And, and again, as I, I pay my respect to the spirits and the ancestors of this land, um, I feel there's more in common than differences. The seas, our ocean does connect us. Um, for ocean people, we see that as a connection, not separation. Um, and, and I feel like we also do have a responsibility to orchestrate how we've been treated, how to, to fear, you know, to, to orchestrate is not the right word, but to drive how we've been treated. And, and together, I think, through these oceans that connect us, we can really have a voice um, to shape how we're treated, uh, how we, we can uh, ask for help or connect, get that resource for help, but also across with each other. You know, how, what are some of the resources that are, are still, or knowledge base that are still exist that we uh, can share or with each other. Um, and, and it has been very powerful for our youth to just be here in Hawaii and to see some of the struggles that um, maybe farther along than they, they're not exposed to. And also with California youth who um, are, are appreciating something they may not have, uh, that our islanders may not know. You see the sunset and all these reefs every day, hey, what's a big deal? But if somebody comes down and makes a comment and all of a sudden they're, you know, they're appreciating that. So I, I you know, we, this youth effort was a, was a effort, it was a result of, of, of some of this work. And how do we pass it on? I just, I, 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 I feel the need to make another quick comment about that. Um, the way people treat each other and see each other um, and the conflict that sometimes arises, um, I think Hawaii is one of the examples where a outside management system took away so much of the traditional management and it created a system that itself created conflict because mm -hmm. people are trying to navigate in a system that wasn't theirs to begin with and with regulations that don't necessarily make sense. And when outsiders come in, as well as the indigenous Hawaiians, um, there's conflict that arises around a management system that neither of them chose. So I think that has created problems, not just human problems, but environmental problems. And I just want to give a shout out to Kalani Hale and the community of Milali'i and Kaimi Kaupiko for their incredibly hard, long journey in just now getting their CBSFA approved. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and my personal feelings that um, I, in the story, am deeply affected by the amount of time it took to do that. Meaning, I don't understand why it takes so long for people to be able to have agency over their own system. So I just wanted to say that. And, and that specific community actually achieved the goals. There's quite a few communities that are still in the process. and are still negotiating to get back to their lands and their rights and their ways of practice. Well, are there, if there's no more questions, does any one of the speakers want to say anything else? If not, we will thank our speakers one more time. Um,